this in the bottom. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Two Narries podcast. I'm your host, James Enner, joined by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Say hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Ron's on the decks, as always. And this week, we have uh, Jory Murray down from County Loud. Jory Murray, you put on events where you help people to fulfill their potential and overcome obstacles and all so- other sorts of stuff. And you're a life coach and you're an author and you've got an interesting story. But for the people that don't know you, first of all, thanks for coming down to meet yeah. us. Yeah, thank you. It's not exactly well. around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know you're going home afterwards. Yeah. And it's night time now, so much appreciated. Yeah, you know. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Um, we know a little bit about you, but you want to just bring it right back for the people that don't know anything about you. Just tell us a little bit about um, where you're from, what it was like growing up. Okay, so um, I live in a little village called uh, Talonstown in County Loud. Um, I'm living there 12 years. I used to live in a, a, t- a county man in a town called Castleblaney. Um, when I was growing up, when I was a baby, I was fostered into my cousin's family. And um, I had a different last name than, than my foster parents. Uh, so that left with a lot of bullying at school. and mm. It left with me when I was growing up. I didn't really feel belonged and stuff like that, you know, and I got a lot of bullying at school, you know. If anyone wanted to deny me, they'd say, there's Jerry Murray there. He's no more than father, you know. I was mm. fighting talk from yeah. back, to the back then, you know. Really, really annoyed me, you know. But, um, so... I, I got, didn't get off to a great start on that end, you know, but I can remember coming home one time uh, off the school bus and there was this guy with a car sitting in the driver. Now, I was only 11, 11 years old like, at the time. And uh, I basically, cut long story short, I write about in my book why he was arrested and that, but I was arrested in the wrong and I was took away. The guards took me away when I was only 11 and they made me admit something I didn't do, you know, breaking into someone's house and that. I honestly didn't didn't do it like, but I can see why they did think I'd done it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so when they made me admit that, then everybody in my local area and that if something happened or something like that, there it was me that got the blame for it. Then you know, mm. so um, so I was getting the blame for all this stuff as I grew up and that and it wasn't me that was doing it at all, you know. Really, really annoyed me. But um, so then I kind of as I got older, then around. 22, 23, I kind of, I wanted to get me revenge with the guards and that, so I used to kind of just really taunt them all the time, and uh, I would have been known to be a really good driver in a car, you know, and mm. I used to be chasing them and winding them up, and they never could catch me, like, you know, but <laughs> now I'd done a lot of stuff to, to, to wind them up, you know, but I felt like, you know, it was my way to get them back for, for what they'd done, you know. Do you know when you were a child uh, in school, um so you were adopted by this foster couple. Um, yeah. Did you grandma with them? Oh, I did. Yeah, they they were great. They were actually my cousins. So yeah. so so yeah. No, so you were kept. In, you was kept in the family. But I suppose you might still have like. Did you still have a feeling of like abandonment or like did did that have an impact on your mental health growing up? Like did you experiment or? Uh, of course it did. You know, like mm. you know, I was seeing psychiatrists from a young age. Like you know, I was depressed from a very young yeah. age. I um. Like I remember when I'd be going to school on the on the bus, I used to be looking out the window and I'd be looking at a lake, like and I'd be thinking that if only had the balls to do it, like mm-hmm. you know, and I, I never really wanted to live, like you know. So I was putting a lot of strong medications from a very very young age, like you know. Really? Yeah. What was school like for you? The bullying, but were like um, academically, were you okay in school? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Like I in school, like I I would have been the worst student in the school, like you know, uh, like. Uh, the school teachers used to tell me I'd never be any good at that. And like, mm. what know? about sports? No, no, no. <laughs> just but a good driver. Just a good driver. <laughs> that was it, you know. I was yeah. brought up on a farm too, so uh, you know, I was started. I was what kind of a farm? Oh, we, we had cows, and you know, we, it was a big farm. We had two separate farms, you know. But uh, tough work. Tough work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was tough work back then. It was, yeah, yeah. You know, bales of hay and all yeah. that kind of stuff. You know, but. you know, in the city in this day and age, and you might be able to speak a little bit more to this thing because you've got kids at the moment. But um, in this day and age, especially in the cities, you know, with the playstations and phones and laptops and social media, I'd say it's a far cry from the childhood you experienced on a farm in Manhattan and Loud. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the thing things are changing a lot now. Like, you know, mm. uh, you know, when you left school, then. Did you 
doing apprenticeship or was it just to stay on the farm? Like, is that how it works? And no, would you believe me? First job was uh, when I was 15 and I was, it was making coffins. <laughs> that, was, that was my first job, <laughs> making coffins. That's yeah. the first thing yeah, we've heard here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. making coffins. I was, I was a captain of making coffins. So that was my first job, yeah. What was that like? How did you get into it? Was it, just it, was, it was just through a friend of mine got me the job. I had, he was at it. And yeah, I actually, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I enjoyed working with the wood and all that kind of yeah. stuff, you know. Do you know, like, when you look at uh, caskets and coffers, like, there's serious craftsmanship goes into them, oh, I'd say. Oh, there is, yeah, yeah. The same work you put into a fitted kitchen and more, actually. Go out there. Because they yeah. are expensive and some yeah, of them can go are, for up yeah. to 10,000 euros, even beyond that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Did you stay at it for long? Yeah, about two years. Go away, and yeah. what happened after that? Uh, I went then <laughs> went working on pianos then would you believe it? restoring pianos yeah different different stuff <laughs> yeah uh, interesting though yeah, mm, yeah, talented you yeah, know yeah, pianos yeah. are very technical aren't they yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. good with the hands yeah 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 yeah. Mm. I enjoyed that like mm. you know um, yeah. after the, how long were you doing the pianos for I was doing that for probably around three and a half years four years do you know so you're in your early 20s there mm. were you in getting involved in trouble around uh, I wasn't too bad around that age, uh, but when I was 21, I decided I wanted to meet my biological, biological dad. And um, so I had started my own business at, the, at this time. Now I started my own business restoring furniture myself, like uh, on my own, like, and mm. um, I enjoyed it, you know, I had a lot of time to think. So I was thinking, you know, uh, about my dad and all that. And I said, you know, I'm gonna, gonna go and meet him. So I went down to his place of work and um, he, wasn't, he wasn't there. And I left my phone number that, and he called me that night. And uh, so I, I, like, I was very excited about, you know, because I was thinking, mm-hmm. oh, what he looked like me, you know, and this, what's his same personality? So I was very, I was very excited about meeting him, you know, and I really had my hopes up about it. So he called me that night, and uh, uh, I answered the phone. He says, who's this? And uh, I says, Gerard Murray. He says, I don't know you. And I says, Gerard Murray, your son. And... Uh, I told him this story that I was going away to America just to make it easier mm. for him to to meet me, like, yeah. you know, I told him I was going away, you know, just to let him know that what didn't want him, I just wanted mm. to meet him before I went, like, um, and then he just says to me, Jerry, he says, you live your life and I'll live my life and basically mm. hung up the phone, you know, I really, I really took that bad and I remember, I'll never forget it, I got off the phone and I blamed it on myself, I thought it was all my fault, like, you mm. know, I thought it was me and, you know, uh, I started to think then, you know, oh, what that school teacher said to me, you know, that I'm good for that. You know, she's actually right. I am good yeah. for that. You know, I started to internalize all this negativity. Yeah, I did. And then I started, you know, turning them to, like, I wouldn't even smoking a hash and stuff like that at that time. But I started taking cocaine and that then, you yeah. know. And you know, be, before you get on to, the, to that side of it, um, do you know the, the parents that raised you? Mm. Do you call them your parents? Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. mum and dad. Were they yeah. your mother's side? Uh, the war, yeah, yeah. And do you know your father? Did he grow up in the same town? Oh. No, no, no. Okay, yes. so you would have never come across him. No, it? no. What about your biological mother? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm still in great contact with her now. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. great. She, she was uh, an alcoholic, like, and she, you know, but we, she's given up to drink now. And she actually inspired me to. You well, know what fair I mean? play, and that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah I can really brilliant. understand yeah. how <coughs> how something like that. Your, your father, who you had all these hopes and aspirations. I didn't meet my own father till I was 20, you know, um, and there was a lot of hope there. And I, uh, growing up, I always wanted to be like him and all these different things, you know. But, like, you were probably suffering already with insecurities, you know, lacks of self-esteem and confidence because of your own growing up through bullying and whatever else. And then for somebody that you put a lot of hope and and what care and, and 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 that you wanted to be loved you basically wanted to be all we ever want is to be loved jury you know and i know that from my own experience you know all i wanted was to be loved something that i didn't really get too much of growing up you know and to be turned away by something like that it must have really really hit you right in the gut like and um and i'd say it was probably the turning point in your life then maybe Going down the wrong road or the drugs and everything else. When you think about it, like, you probably, as soon as you picked up, it was probably going to end up bad for you, like, because you had these underlying issues, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And we've had a few people on to us actually recently, yeah. um, people that have been in similar circumstances to yourself. They wanted us to cover the topic because 
um, not people directly in the same situation as you, but children have been adopted or children have grown up in the care system, the way over are represented in treatment centres, prisons mm -hmm. and homeless hostels, you know. So there's a serious correlation between adoption and care and negative life outcomes, you know, because even if you had you no know, great foster parents and your mother was able to, you had a good relationship with her, there's still something there, do you know what I mean? And like Timmy said, you'll mm -hmm. always want your father, do you know what I mean? And if it didn't work out for you, like, we turn to substances. And, Absolutely. you know, when you started experimenting, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so look, I started with the cocaine, um, and, uh, yeah, I got, I got addicted to it for a good few years. Um, then I started involved in different crimes and that. Mm. Then I got two years in prison. Right, you skipped way on there. <laughs> so you went straight into the cocaine. So there wasn't yeah. like typically people like, oh, it's that, it's more and harsh, and it's not solvents. But because you were working, man, you were doing your own business at this stage. Mm. So you had money, so you were able to get cocaine. And then you got involved in crime. Was that directly through the drugs? Did you like start to use the snort and coke and then start selling it in weight? Or did you commit other crimes to get the money for the coke? How did it work out? I, um, you know, as you know, cocaine's a dear habit, like, it <laughs> you is, know, yeah, so yeah. I started getting involved involved in crime to, to be able to buy, buy co the cocaine, like, you mm. know, uh, lost my business and, you know, I was, was full-time in the crime then at that stage, like. Did you, as, you, as you do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As you do, yeah. You have yeah. to feel it, you have to do it somewhere, yeah. you know, and um, crime really is, especially if you're good at certain things like driving and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're going to turn to what you're good at. If it's Absolutely. not true education or true, you've been a craftsman or something like that, you're going to turn to the next if, thing. If you can't sing or you're not you know, a movie actor. Exactly. So you, you got a job you, with your driving skills. I did, yeah. Courier. Yeah. Courier, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You probably can't tell us the details in that now because you might be dragged in for a section after. <laughs> I've had no money at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, obviously that didn't work out too good for you. Eventually you ended up in prison. Yeah, look, as I say, like, you know, when I was Korean, you know, like uh, the the relationship I had with the guards and that wasn't good, like, so mm. they knew I was Korean and I was Korean for a man they really wanted as well, you know, and... Uh, so me and him became very good friends, and so it became, a, became like a war with me and him against mm. the, the guards, like, and that, and so they never could catch me driving, ever, mm. like. You did know? You, do you know when you were carrying drugs in your in your car, um, did you always have confidence that no matter what pulled up, you were going to get away? Absolutely. I used to say this to the guards. I used to say, if you ever catch me driving, I'll shake your hand. Go away over there. Honest to God. And I was dead serious, <laughs> like, because I knew, I knew they never would. <laughs> We'll have to go go counting someday. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, uh. It's the only place we can get away with driving like that these days. That's true, uh, yeah. Uh. Um, so how did you get caught? It wasn't through me driving. It was through... Uh, so it would have been back in... Um, uh, when I was about 23, I went through... I was actually... I was working in Dublin at the time. And I met this girl and... Uh, we were going out for a while and she moved into my flat and... Um, she was... Uh, she wasn't there one evening. I was tidying up the flat, and I found a needle in the flat. And she was taking heroin. I found out she was taking heroin. Like I never would have known anything about heroin at the time. Mm. So I was down at home, and um, I messaged. Her. I said, "Look, I says, uh, or she messaged me looking for her stuff out of the flat." And I said, "I'll be back there on Monday. I'll give it to you then." And she's no one wanted now. I said, "Look, I'm home, down home for the weekend. I'll, I'll give it to you Monday." So then um, she uh, messaged me saying, "Look, I've something to tell you. I've HIV. So have you." Mm. Um, so I was like, ah, she's only saying this to me, piss me off. Like, mm. so um, I remember me and her had a conversation before with people that took their lives and that. And I was telling about a friend of mine that how he took his life and that. And I told her I was going to do the same, like you know, if I had it, thinking she texted back, no, look, you you don't have it, you know. Um, but she texted back, you know, there's not what I wanted to hear. She texted back saying there's medication out there now that will help you, you know. Mm. So that really, I was like, oh shit. What you year know? is this now? Uh, probably would have been maybe around 2000, probably around 2000, maybe, mm. around that year, 2002 or three, something around that. Like. Mm. Yeah. And um, in County Loud, was this, you were in County Loud at this time? Oh, no, right. I would have been around my home place in, in, in Castle Lady. Was heroin a big thing up there at the time? No, well, see, she was from Dublin. 
Oh, okay. she, she was from Dublin. Yeah. The fucking know. dubs are the bastards. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> James, you're going to be putting a hit list over there. Right? Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm a half a dub, so I can get away with it. But no, because uh, I only say that because uh, the heroin problem was kind of isolated to Dublin at that time. Do you know, because around that time in Cork, we didn't really have a heroin problem. Mm. I was thinking the other counties was probably similar enough. But it did spread, obviously. Um, and did you guess, did, did you end up testing positive for HIV? No, but but like there was no heroin down down around where I was like at all. It's like, just that she was from Dublin. Yeah. yeah. But um, I went to get tested um, with, with my doctor and the doctor. You know, I thought I'd get that test straight away. But then he told me I had to wait for a second test for six months. That's right, yeah. So I really just went crazy in that mm. six months, and I got involved in it. Mm. Didn't give a crap. Like, mm. do you know what I mean? What? So um, I I got involved. I stole some machinery, but and um, what kind of machinery? Tractors. <laughs> tractors, tractors. Laugh weird. There's serious money involved in, in know, the machinery, yeah. and it's, it's a big thing within yeah. the in, in Northern Ireland and yeah. the Republic. How, like, you probably can't tell me, like, but I'm trying to think, like, how do you actually rob a tractor? It's not like going in and mm. putting a fucking down your back pocket or, you know, into a tin file bag. Like, like, are you going in with a lorry and loading it up the back of it and taking off out of it? Have you got buyers for equipment like that before you go in? Or? Look, I'd, I'd just send someone up to like look. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was kind of. It was a once off. This time it was. It was our first time doing it, and yeah. uh, me and a couple of friends done it. Uh, it was just looking. Any key nearly starts them all. So yeah, oh, yeah. So. good to know. <laughs> <laughs> just in case but things don't work out, right? be swinging out of a massive focus <laughs> in there now when the podcast goes yeah. bust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that won't happen. But uh, no, that's interesting stuff. Mm. So. It went mad for that six months. I can understand why. Mm, yeah. You think, fucking hell, yeah. you know, the world is going to end. And what happened after the end of the six months? Did you get the results? Got the results. They were, they were clear, yeah. It was all clear, yeah. you were lucky. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. Mm. Well, do you know what? That, that, that must have been fucking tough. Mm. Really, really tough to live six months. Like, to, to know that you might have something that could affect you for the rest of your life. Because, as we all know, there's a lot of people that get blood transfusions get HIV from it and, and other forms of um, blood tra- blood diseases through that way like it must be absolutely awful for for people to be told like you've HIV never before used needle or was out there fucking what selling themselves or anything like that and to be told like it must be an awful thing to, to I have think over you like for I six think, months I think before you can give blood you have to be tested anyway. Yeah. So I don't think you can get a pass through blood transfusions. Okay. But like um, previously, my previous life, I had hepatitis A, which you get tr- through dirty water and stuff, you know? So um, I remember when I got, when I came into recovery, got tested, you know, I check out everything. And that was the only thing. They just said they had antibodies that fought it. But um, it's, you can get it through dirty fruit and water and all these mad things. Mm. It's more common in third world countries. Yeah. But the lifestyle and your active addiction, it's just dirty and I was using intravenously. No, there's no share or anything like that. But uh, the point is, I can't give blood. You know, even though I don't have anything that I can pass on to anybody, but I have the antibodies that was there, you know. So yeah. um, I just be careful that people be like, oh, I'm not getting a blood transfusion, you know, because Timmy said on the podcast, yeah. so I just have to be careful. Yeah, yeah. So well, I didn't mean nothing by it. Yeah. I just meant like, but it has happened in the past. You do hear stories where people do get transfusions and they pick up some form of disease. But that's probably before yeah. these days. We hope come. it's not like that no more, anyway. <laughs> yeah. but the, I do, because there'll be people up now in my fucking door, <laughs> Yeah. But even uh, people that have HIV that might be listening to the podcast, like, nobody wants HIV, nah. but it's not the death sentence it used to be. No. Do you know, and people mm-hmm. do survive and live fulfilled lives while yeah. on medication. Thankfully, you didn't get it. So what happened after that? So, like, you know, I got myself into the, the, the trouble of the crime and that at that time. Um, then I started, it was then I started, around that time I started currying. <clears throat> and uh, that was going good for me, like, in that. Um, and, but, like, like, the guards really, really, really had it out for me. And they were, they, were just, mm. they were just torturing me, like, you know what I mean? They really were. Mm. My, my friend, no one could even hang out with me or the torture anyone who was hanging out yeah. with me. They really, really, really wanted to really um, stop me what I was doing, and you know. Um, so I remember the raid, the raid at my uh, home place for, for drugs, like, and I remember the head of the DS coming up to me and 
saying what's your address and I says no fix the boat like I'd always say that to him you know and he says well it's down as your home place that that's where you're living he says we're going to raid that for drugs and I looked and I says don't you go near that house like I says you know like they're mm -hmm. you know uh, good people and never involved in crime or anything like really good people you know and he just looked at me and says I bet we'll piss you off won't it and next morning went out and raided the place mm -hmm. for drugs like you know mm -hmm. um, so you know, I just, that was only one bit of it, like, you know, they were just absolutely torturing me and um, they arrested me one time and I had a fair the other one arrested me and uh, I went and they cut my wrists in the cell. <coughs> and, uh, in the guard station? In the guard station, yeah, they played me pocket, they, they didn't get it, like, uh, cut my wrists in three places, like, and uh, one of the done, then I said, oh shit, what did I do? I actually, you know, I want to see mm. the blood coming out and everything. I said, oh, no, I don't want the next thing. I went up to press the buzzer and there was no bloody, the buzzer was broken, like. So I just lay back then, but lucky enough, someone came to check me after a few minutes, you know. Can I ask you about the time when you cut yourself? Like, what's going through your head? Are you depressed from drugs or is it just the lifestyle getting too much for you? Have you enough? Or? I was taking a lot, of, a lot of cocaine at the time and there was a lot of anger in me, like. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of anger in me in, in, against the guards, like, and, you know, it was just... Just a release, like? Yeah, my head was just all over mm -hmm. the place, like. It's a way away, it's a way away from feeling what's going on for you. Yeah, well, look, it, it was. I feel like it was done through anger, like mm -hmm. really was done through anger, like to say that you no know, people lost self harm like that, like they so much internal emotions that they can't handle yeah. and internal pain that they couldn't take shoulder your head and it focuses mm -hmm. around that, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, like yeah. it's, it's like takes a coping mm. skills, you know? Makes sense too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, because when you yeah. cut your wrist, like, fucking hell, you're out of your head, then you're like, oh my God, I'm bleeding, you know? Mm. Mm. So, there's, a, uh, there's a sense of relief from it as well, because I, I, when I was young, I would have self-harmed as well. Uh, but there's a, there was a, a sense of relief seeing yourself being cut and blood coming from it. Mm. There's a sense of, oh, do you know, it takes, as you said there, James, you were spot on, it takes you out of your head, mm. and now you're focused on this, and there's nearly a little bit of, will somebody notice and give me a bit of attention? Yeah. You know, that's because I wasn't getting very much attention at the time. But when when they see that, it's negative attention, but yeah. it's still attention. It's like um, physical pain is probably easier to handle than emotional yeah. pain. Yeah. You know? Okay. It's like if you're in emotional pain, then you cut yourself and next you feel relief. Yeah. If you feel relief from physical yeah. pain, it means yeah. obviously. But um, the guards, they arrived eventually. Yeah, they did, yeah, and the ambulance drivers came in and took me out, and, well, actually, on the way out, then the guard that actually said that to me, be raiding the home place and that, he was standing there, and the ambulance driver says, why do you do that, and why do you do that, and I says, because of him there, and I went for him, and I had to put the, the guard actually in the cell, because I was going <laughs> to, mm. you know, but I know, so I got brought to the hospital, got stitches in my arm and that, and bandaged up. And then it was a few days after that, then uh, I got arrested again. I brought to court and I bandaged all around my arms and that. And they arrested me for breaking bail conditions and sent me to Clover Hill Prison. Um, and to me, this to this day, I think the, the guards had some kind of connections with the governor over the prison because they left me in the holding cell for seven days, like, with no clothes on me, it's freezing cold, like, pure torture. Mm. So I was in, I got out of the, the pallet cell like for seven days, I was in there for seven days, got out of the pallet cell after seven days and uh, into the, the prison then. For, I was there for a total of three weeks like, and I got out, out of the prison and... Um, Did you know anybody in there? No, no, it was a remand prison, you know, like yeah. not just a, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You, you know uh, so for people that don't know fuck all about prisons, Clover Hill is where people can go when they're on remand mm. for cases. Yeah. Or they can go there, like a lot of people from car prison would go, if they got denied bail in Cork, they could go to Dublin to the High Court for bail mm. and go to the Clover Hill while they're waiting on the court. But you, you were denied bail, or you were brought in off bail? Uh, yeah, I was being brought in for break of bail, yeah. And yeah. you were there for three weeks? Three weeks, yeah. It's your first experience in prison, First really? experience, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a tough one, isn't it? Especially, it's yeah, 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 it was. It was, it was yeah. a tough one, like, you know, when, it, when I came out, I, I just turned my life around, like. Yeah. in a positive way like mm. what was what was it like what did you do when you got out I got out I went to a friend that had a business that was involved in furniture and that and I went to him and asked him could I get a partnership in his business well could I do my own would he rent a, a bit of his his shed to me like you know so I could do my own stuff like and he said he said he would and um, it was actually it was uh, in, in my local village 
the the workshop was behind the guard of the guard barracks like right behind the guard barracks and I was carrying up four hundred every day and putting another foot pad for sale and that and the guard just come up to me and say fair play if you turn your life around I wouldn't drive or anything like you know what I mean I just I mm. caught myself on I said no oh, way do I want the life of that mm. prison stuff like you know it really woke me up like mm, yeah so it turned my life around and I was it was enjoying like really enjoying life like for the first time ever my life I was really really enjoying life you know and um. Now, in regards to the machinery took and all that, like, yeah, it was all left back, like, so I didn't feel like to be much about that. So I was still waiting for that court case, like, so the machinery took, it was all left back, so um, that court case was still coming up. Uh, so I came up, I had that business going for maybe about nine or ten months, like, um, then I went to court, and uh, the sergeant basically stood up in the stand and told lies like said to the judge I don't know if anything about Jerry changed his life around or anything about him having a business or really just sent me down like mm. you know um, so I got two years that day that I didn't expect like mm. uh, then uh, yeah I got two years and where did you go for the where, where were you sentenced to uh, Mount Jai is that where people from Lourdes go yeah well I was sentenced in Monaghan so it was and so you're sentenced to people from Monaghan they go to Mount Joy is that typical yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah. and uh, what was it like in there <laughs> cultural shock <laughs> brave shock again yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a brave shock like you know uh, yeah it was a brave shock like it was, especially if you're after turning your life around it. yeah and then to go into court and be given a prison sentence and to be going in there then with a good good space in your mind and into the negativity you're going in there then and you're caught up in fight or flight you know you're, the adrenaline's pumping through your body because you don't know what's going to happen you know you're walking down the landings and they're all just staring at you you know mm-hmm. it's a tough tough environment to it be put into like it was tough I, I, and I think what annoyed me more was you know I knew that the, 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 the guard like I knew it was him that just wanted to send me down like, because when I when I got to two years and I was in the holding cell uh, in the barracks, like he came down and he lifted the latch up, and I was I could see someone giving me the finger, like and I went up and I looked out, and there he it was he looked uh, through the latch, like and there he was giving me the finger, like you know what I mean? So mm. more or less, I got you, like mm. you know. Um, but uh, yeah, did, did you know anybody in Mount Chai? No, I didn't. So know. do you know when you went in there first? How did you integrate? Or, like, well. Well, funny enough, now when when I got sentenced, there was two guys there that got sentenced at the same time as me, and they got twelve years. Like, and we kind of we were in the, we were in a holding cell in Mentai uh, for about well, therefore they were there for about three days, and they got moved out. Like, but we I got on well with them guys. Um, they were from Limerick, and um, then then I I was in that cell holding cell for about I think about six days. Because it was overcrowded at that time. Mm. Then I got sent into a four man, uh, four man cell. Then, but there was a guy there. And I was, look, he was probably in a prison all his life, but he used to leave uh, a syringe and under my pillow at night. Like, do you know what I mean? So, it's what can I say? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. At, that, at that time, you know. So, uh, did you start using heroin inside though? Not at that, that time. No, not at that time. But I did start here when, when, when I was in prison, yeah. Okay. Um, was it in Mount Jai? No, so I got moved to Port Leash and um, I I just, I, I said I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. I got stuck into the gym and I was going to the gym three hours a day and there was another guy I met and me and him was training together, a big, big lump of a lad, you know, and mm. then we got moved to a, an open prison, Lachlan House. And uh, one day I was just wa- I was walking down, I walked into his cell, and there he was smoking heroin, like, and I was like, jeez, and I just walked back out. First time I've ever seen mm-hmm. it, like. Mm-hmm. I've seen needles in that before, but I've never actually seen it on a tin file. And then he came back up to my cell, and he said, look, Jerry, it's not all that bad. And I was there, I don't know, it's not for me, like. And the same day I, had two, I took two Valium tablets, so I was a bit relaxed to myself, you yeah. know. Yeah, inhibitions were low. Yeah. And I started, I, I lay back and said to myself, look at the size of him, like he's a big, strong lad. Maybe it's not that bad, I'll try it. Like. Mm. So I went back down and I said, look, give me a blast of it there. So I took a few lines of it and went back and when I puked and back down and lay, lay down in my bed and I thought I'd close my eyes for an hour, but it was 12 hours. Like. And I said, mm. geez, this is some job for passing time. Like. I know, mm. I know. And then we toured time. Like, I knew nothing about the sickness of heroin. Like, I knew mm. nothing about it. Like, 
farmer by I suppose you know yeah, but yeah. never knew anything about it like so the third time I took it I says to your man I says eh, geez, I don't feel well myself you know and he says oh, that's, that's a sickness I says what sickness what do you mean sickness like you know and he says you need to cure so that's when yeah, I actually really if you smoke heroin for a few days for a period of time and then you don't have it you go to physical withdrawal like anybody that takes any opiates for a period of time people that are addicted to painkillers like norofin and codeine mm-hmm. based if you take them for a period of time and you don't have any you'll be physically sick and that's kind of the physical dependence you know so you experience that up there it's you know in house it's an open prison it's in cavern mm-hmm. um is there any like uh, urine tests or anything like that no, there was, yeah, yeah. And was. did that ever, did, did we ever turn over there for it or we have divided or? No, uh, I was thrown out of Lachlan House, but not for that reason. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, that's another story. Go on, sure, you might as well tell us. Uh, so I'm here now, might as well tell you, right? So, uh, <laughs> if you're comfortable. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, all. look, it's all in my books, so, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. it's all in my books, so I'm not, you know. If, if you're comfortable, we'll only we'll talk about whatever you're comfortable yeah, yeah, about, yeah, you know, because yeah. your story. Your story is um, is very important. Yeah, you know, yeah. it just uh, talks about how it could happen to anybody. Of course, yeah. you don't have to be grown up in one of the worst parts of the country, mm. worst towns or cities. It can happen to a, a lad who's brought up on the farm in the middle of the countryside. You know, of course, and yeah. it's very, very important. So, um, as I said, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, that that's why I'm here today, and yeah. you know, well. It will uh, make someone. If I had been listening to myself twenty years ago, maybe I might have made mistakes. Yeah. That you know. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. You know, that and that. That's it, really. You know. Yeah. So, I got my first weekend out of prison in Lachlan House. How far from Lachlan House are you living? Uh, it's been an hour and a half from from my hometown. Yeah. And um, so I went out on the beer and I was drinking, drinking the same way as I thought I could drink when I before I went in, like, and. Uh, I got a bottle of vodka and I downed it and stone drunk and uh, me and a friend of mine were acting with these aerosol cans. I was after spilling whiskey on my jeans and uh, from my knee to, to my feet like mm. and we were acting these, these aerosol cans pinking at each other messing you know and my jeans went to fire from the inside and I was that much drinking I didn't know that my fucking legs was in fire like. Mm. Woke up the next morning with third degree bones. Fucking hell. On my leg like and uh cut a long story short I had to go to the bone june at dublin and um was in there for three weeks it must have been serious oh very bad I had skin grafts and all like cool, you know. okay. yeah yeah you so, look you didn't burn something else off whatever about the legs the other thing was gone anyway you might as well pack it up we'd have ended up with no lang or you would have been yeah. fucked then <laughs> You were in the hospital for three weeks. Yeah, and then when when I went in first, I um, I knew heroin was good for pain, like. Yeah. And I rang a dude up and I says to him, I said, "Look, I'm in the hospital here. What way? I don't want to inject it. I said, "What other way can I take it?" He says, "Snort it like a lane of coke." Mm. So I got some left in and that, and I don't know exactly what he said to do. Like I started like a lane of coke, probably with that size there. Do you know what I mean? And uh, next thing, boom, I, I was out, like you know, yeah. uh, and. Uh, like I write about it in my book mm. and uh, like as I say in my book like you know there's no words that would give it credit to what I felt like mm. and it wasn't from the taking of heroin it was because I went to the other side like mm. I died in the hospital bed I was just going to say do you know snorting heroin it's a very very dangerous way yeah. of taking the drug I know I, mean, <laughs> I, I know figured that, yeah. there's a few people from Nakanahini have died from it yeah. that I know yeah, well yeah. and um, even when I was snorting it myself you could snort, you could take it, like heroin is a potent enough drug when you're in small amounts of it. And when you smoke it, obviously it takes time because you, you know, it may take it 15, 20 minutes to get through the bag. But when you snort it, you take the whole lot of it and it doesn't hit you straight away. Like I've injected too, so when you inject the drug, mm. it hits you like that. Yeah. So when you go into the blood, you're gone. Yeah. But when you snort it, you don't feel nothing. And then it creeps up on you. And then before you know it, you're fucking killed. And so let's say if you, if you, and this is my experience, but if you snort it a bit of gear, you might give it five or ten minutes and then you might take another small bit, you know, mm. and then before you know it, you're unconscious, you know. And what the whole model, what we're trying to say here is do not snort it. heroin, like. Yeah. Or if you take a full stop. Yeah, don't take a full stop. If you're going to snort it, snort it <laughs> yeah. with somebody next to you. But you know where people do get confused around the heroin? 
and some films or series, whatever they might be watching at home, people are snorting heroin and they're looking at them getting the buzz off it or whatever. That is not the reality of it. You no, know, just heroin you kill, kill you like oh, immediately. Yeah, you know, yeah. it shuts yeah. down your respiratory system. So Especially if there's whatever mixes in it these days, like that fentanyl or whatever else, like that can kill you, yeah. like that. But the, the the heroin tells the brain. The brain stops telling the lungs to move, basically, and your lungs just stop breathing, uh-huh. and it suppresses the respiratory system. So that's what happened to you. Mm. Uh, lucky you were in the hospital when it happened. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you think about like fellas that are down in their bedroom. That's that's how fellas are mm. found dead. You know what I mean? And mm. the longer you're under, like the brain damage happens. Then you know. Mm. So if you're found. You could have, you know, damage, you know, yeah. that you can't undo from lack of oxygen to the brain. Mm. We know people like that too, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. But uh, you were very lucky, Jerry. Blessed, yeah. What was it like when you came around? It was... What was it like under, or what's your memories of that whole time? Eh, uh, look, I went to, you know, I went to the other side, and all I could feel was just pure love and peace. Mm. Do you really? know what I mean? And uh, I didn't want to come back here. You know, mm-hmm. I thought I thought the doctor that had the fibula or shock me. I thought he was like, you know, he's the devil. Like, you know, why why are you doing that? Like, just just leave me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like and at at that time, like I was there. Like, geez, why did I get a second chance? You know, I'm someone that's in prison, drug addict. Like, you know, what good am I to say mm-hmm. it? You know, at that time, I thought that. You know, but mm-hmm. there was a plan for me. You yeah. know, and, I, and I'm still here. Yeah. So, did you go back to Lock and House? I uh, went back to Lachlan House and then the the governor thought it was a night array punishment beating us after get because I told him I fell asleep in front of a fire. I yeah, he wasn't <laughs> believing that. Like. <laughs> I couldn't tell them I was out drinking. Like, <laughs> <you know>? so, <laughs> they didn't believe that so I got sent to Castle Reed then and, I, and I, was, I was in crutches. County Roscommon. Yeah. Rough. What was it like over there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> was, it rough, was that the roughest prison you were in? Cloverhill and Castlery. Look, I think Cloverhill probably would have been the worst. But Castlery, now it was probably because it was in crutches. I ended up getting bullying. Mm. Oh really? Yeah, and it was you know mm. it was I had sleepless nights over it. Like you know what I mean? Were you in single cell or doubled up or what? Single. Mm. And we were isolated over there. Like, no, no, I was just it was on the land and like single cell. Yeah. And you know like when um, do you know when you're in Castlery and you're being bullied like. Have you any friends over there? Do you know anybody over there? Or? I, do you see, as I was saying there, was two two Limerick guys that, that yeah. yeah, so I became very good friends with them. Um, they actually, you know, the word God sent mm. through me sentence, like, you know, so yeah. I became good friends with them. So I had their number, like, I, I took my phone with me from Lachlan House back to Castlery, so I had my phone with me, like. Yeah, legally. Uh, of course yeah. <laughs> uh, that was probably inside and the, the bandage <laughs> <laughs> for giving out something all like, the secrets you know. something like that yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know so I called them guys up and I, I said to them you know like I'm, fucking, I'm getting hassled here like you know and they said look we'll, we'll sort something out because they a big connection these guys like you know mm. um, but the guys was coming in just about Five days passed and I couldn't sleep at night or anything. I was off the crutches at this stage. Couldn't sleep at night with just pure anger, like, you know, with these three guys coming in all the time looking for me fags, like. Mm. And um, then one morning, so I, I just started getting myself back in shape again, exercising my leg and that, you know, so I was able to walk again. I was off the crutches and uh, then the ringleader came in on his own one morning. But I was set, I, I was set to take the three of them out of my own, like, I was just, I had enough, like, at this mm-hmm. stage. So it was all planned out, like. And um, so when he came in the zone, and when he came in the zone, I banged the cell door over, like, and uh, kind of choked him against the wall for a while. And uh, he was shouting and roaring the prisoner, or the, the screw came up and opened the door, like, and he looked in and he knew what was going on, like, but he didn't say anything. I didn't get any trouble about it or anything like that. But then the next day, this this big guy came in with tattoos on the eyes, like, oh shit, like, I'm bollocks now, you know. Well, next thing it was actually the Limerick boys that sent the, the boy with the tattoos, to, mm. you know, to, yeah. to see if it was all right. And I told him the crack, and he sat with me in a cup of tea, and just we were, we were having a cup of tea, and that. And next thing the three boys was walking past that was bullying me, like, and they looked in, and next thing I said it to your man, that was the guys, like, and he just stared, and I just gave us a scary, mm. he was in for life, like, mm. you know, um, he had nothing to lose, like, he was a scary, he was a scary boy, like. 
So I'd say they were the boys shitting themselves after that, like, you yeah. know, but, um, yeah, that was my experience. That was the end of the bullying? That was the end of the bullying. Yeah, yeah. it just shows why we stand up to the bullies and... Yeah, yeah. you have to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Look, the, I was just an easy target, like. You know. Look, that is, your story is the reality of a lot of stories like that in the prison. You know. You know, I've, I've seen some stuff. It's horrible, isn't yeah, it? And, uh, Especially when you have a disability like that. Yeah. Like, you know, how you're defenceless, you know what I mean? Mm. And in the, in an environment like that, like, you will be preyed upon, like, mm. especially when you're out, you're, you're not in your, home, your hometown, you don't know anybody. Did you end up going back to Lock and House or did you get released from there? Or what was the crack? Got released from there. Yeah, I got released from there, yeah. You had a rough old time, we were all the same, didn't you? And you oh, got a yeah. tour of Ireland as well. <laughs> yeah. For free, yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. I got released from there, but, you know, I came out just lunatic altogether, like. Did you? Ah, yeah, so it, more connections. Mm. You know, That's what happens. You had, Sarah, you had a drug addiction to heroin as well. Yeah, yeah, you know? I came out with that as well, like, you know, and best contacts around Ireland for yeah. stuff, and, yeah. yeah. And what was life like when you got out? Did you go back to your hometown? Yeah, yeah, I did. I went back to my hometown, yeah. Were you back working or did you go back into crime? Or? I was a crime for a while and then I started, uh, started selling cows then. And, uh, yeah. It's Not a form of crime? Ripping no. people off? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, no, I didn't. I mean, no, 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 no. We all know they use cows. Yeah, it's meant to be as people. Like. But, uh, Best, so you, yeah. You went legit? I went legit, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. So, to speed things up a little bit, how did you end up getting in, like, I'm looking at some of the stuff, you have a diploma in body language, mm. a diploma in addiction therapy, certified life coach, um, and then you have the businesses that we spoke about, including the pub landlord, which we haven't spoken about. Um, how did you end up getting into the self-help piece? How, how did that come about? Uh, from a very young age, from I was 10, 11, I always had a dream when I'd be older that I'd be like a doctor or a psychiatrist or a counsellor or something like that. That's always was my dream, like, you know. And then I thought I went down the wrong road. But I actually didn't. I went down a road that I've experienced at all. And I came out the other end of it, you mm. know. Um, and I remember going on an event one time and um, I just seen guys, you know, that I was running it, you know, like with... Uh, you know, guys, not like myself, but, you know, like, like business owners and that. And, you know, because I thought you'd need some kind of diploma to do all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, and it just, it just changed my life, what, what I learned at that event. It just, just totally changed my life, so it did. And um, then um, after that, then my sister passed away. She was only 22. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. And um, I said to myself, you know, like... A, it's time for me to make a change, like, you know, and um, I set a goal when I was on, on that uh, event to become a public speaker, and there was a guy that was at the event, heard me story, and he says, look, he says, I'd like you to do a talk for me, uh, on well-being and that, and uh, so the goal I had set, I said, if I was ever asked to speak, I'd always say yes, you know, so I set that goal, was asked to speak, and um, went and I spoke at it and started me off at that, uh, Started me off getting into that, and yeah, it's um, what was it like doing the first public speak? Oh, Pu god, <laughs> tough, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's tough, yeah. It, uh, my neck from here down just wouldn't stop shaking, like, yeah. 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 you know, just uncontrollably, just would not yeah. stop shaking, like. And how are you doing it? How are you doing it today? Yeah, look, uh, as a uh, <laughs> I'll give you an example. So, the way when I, when I run my events. I was running one day in August and uh, there was a couple of people that was coming was in this game longer than me, they were in it 15, 20 years, like coming to listen to me that and see what it's about. And there's a woman that works on, on my team with me and she says to me, she says, are you nervous, Jerry? And I looked at her and I says, do you know what? I says, uh, I never was as confident doing something in, in my life as I was mm. driving. You know what I mean? That's how confident I am in yeah. what I do now. Is, yeah. is, is, I have the same confidence that I had when I was driving in what I do now. Like. Yeah. You know what I get since we've sat down here at the table? I get a real sense of authenticity. Mm. I've, I've just been real about what you're about and mm. who you are. And you, there's a, a, a real calmness around you as well. You know, there's... It's just a really relaxed and you can probably feel it as well. Oh, yeah, pure, you know? pure, pure relaxed. Yeah. Well, I feel it from you guys too. Like, yeah. you know, it's... Mm. 
you know, on this podcast, you just have to be yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Simple as that. There's no, yeah. like, nobody's talking about crime. Like, oh, I was this big fucking mad gangster. It's not, not that. Yeah, yeah. This is just what my life was like. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For, for good or for bad. You know, yeah. And going back like, to the, even the public speaking side of it there, it is a difficult process for any human being, but I'm sure at some stage in your life and in my life, we would have thought that, nah, I could never do that, you know? But no, it just goes to show that any human being can do absolutely anything with their lives. They can become a public speaker, they can become a doctor, they can be, it's all about how much they want it, you know? And it's, about, it's also about, a massive part is about overcoming those fears, you know? You're going to feel a lot of fear, you're going to feel anxious, you're going to feel... Mm you know it's terrible you know and I, I remember me and James were uh, on the Clareborne show there recently and there was cameras there there was Clare there was an audience there my heart literally was beating completely out of my chest and my mouth started going going dry you know and I started laughing <laughs> in the middle of the show I started laughing to myself saying to myself what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> I look around and say, what the, what the fuck am I like? What am I doing here? I'm sitting in the chair and bright lights and all this. And next, all of a sudden, she says, oh, and you, Timmy, um, can you tell us? And I said, oh, next, these words were coming out of my mouth. I didn't even know what I was saying. You know, I didn't even, I forgot what the question was, you know. But the point being, I felt that feeling of real, really strong fear and... Yeah. And anxiousness, we over two of us did. Yeah. Two of us, we were speaking about it after the two of us felt it. But the next time it will be easier. Yeah, the next absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Next time. Public speaking is a, there's a skill in it, you know. And yeah. part of the skill is trying to be composed and try to keep be calm. There's a buzz out of it too. Oh, yeah. here, man! When I done my first talk, the drunk <laughs> never gave me that feeling. Yeah. Oh, I was buzzing. Yeah. yeah, but absolutely buzzing. Yeah. And you do your own events today. Yeah, do you yeah. Want to tell us a little bit about them. What are they like? And are they weekend events or are they? Yeah, all? look, they're, they're three day events. Um, you know, I have had all walks of life come to them. You know, I have like uh, if you go on to my Facebook page, there you'll see testimony videos like from school teacher, or school teacher, just all walks of life. Like, do you know what I mean? And for me, like, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be watching testimony videos of the people sometimes and, and they'd tear up, like, because, yeah. like, that was, that's my dream, like. I'll give you an example of uh, my next three-day of what I'm doing is on the tour of my February and my birthday, like. That's how much I love doing them, like. That's nice. It's just, it's just seeing the results in the people. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's just seeing them, you know, like, I've seen people, like, you know, come in nervous and, you mm. know what I mean, suffer anxiety and, then just to see them after, you know, I just had a girl that there was at me one in August, and she was she was back she was she was from England and she was back there at the weekend and she's just so calm, yeah, mm. do you know what I mean? Just so relaxed and mm. another guy was saying to me, I saved his life, like do you know yeah. what I mean? Like to hear that stuff, like so I'm I'm living my dream, like. Do but you know even I, mean? I think what I think is very important about your um, events as well is they're different to everything else. It's about forgiveness. You base them on forgiveness and, and letting go. You know, that's that's very important. And we had a brief chat beforehand about mm. forgiveness. And forgiveness is a word that can be used a lot. But it, there's a lot to forgiveness because forgiveness is also, there's it, it's attached to resentment to people, you know. But to be able to really forgive somebody is like, it's a feeling. You know, it's, it's, it's not just a word, oh, I forgive you, but it's a feeling. So whenever you see a person that's connected to an, uh, an experience with you, maybe a negative one, and it's to be able to feel love for them instead of complete resentment or, I don't like the word hatred because it's, I don't, I don't know, I don't think it's even, it should be a word. Hatred is a really strong word, but yeah. forgiveness, can you tell us a little bit about the f- word forgiveness and what it means to you? So I can tell you on my experience in forgiveness, you know, and, and the results, like, you know, so, so forgiveness is just one thing that, that I do at my mm. events. Like, I go through a lot of stuff, like, you know, um, it's all stuff that I've put into practice in my life, stuff that I've changed my life, you know what I mean? It's all stuff that I've played my life for before I teach it to people. Um, but, you know, one of the things 
I, f I really get people to do at my events is finding their purpose in life. You know, because when you find your purpose, it's not stopping you, like. Mm. You know, I've found my purpose, but everybody's purpose is different, like. Do you know what I mean? We mm. all have a purpose here. So I show people like that. Like, my book's called You Can Do Anything, because you can, like. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? When you find your purpose, there's nothing will stop you. Do you know what I mean? Because, like, you know, sometimes, you know, we give our energy to what's not serving us, you know, to getting the next bag of coke or getting the next bag of heroin. Do you know what I mean? We're putting, yeah. we're getting our energy towards that. That's what we would be mm -hmm. thinking at the time. That's our purpose. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when you actually find your purpose from your heart, do you know what I mean? All the cravings or, or all your energy that's going to get them bags next to you, you, you put it towards your dream, like. Mm -hmm. So you're putting your energy towards something else, your passion, mm -hmm. like. You know, so... I help people find that and, um, you know, I just showed them how, how to do that. Uh, and, you know, it's just because, like, I had business before and I'd never say that I failed at them. I learned from them all, like, mm -hmm. I, I learned where I went wrong with them, mm -hmm. you know. And I showed people where I went wrong and I, and I showed them, like, I, I started this business just before lockdown and the business still going, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the job I had before that, I really liked that job, you know what I mean? It was a handy job, I was getting paid well. Um, and it, I didn't step back to that job. I, I stuck at this one. Do you know what I mean? Because sometimes we give up too easy. Mm. There's, there's, a, there's a story in Think and Grow Rich, Three Foot from Gold. Did you ever read that? No. As I, look, I probably haven't the time to get into it now, but it's, it's ba I'll tell you the short version of it. Yeah. It's basically about a man that bought all this thrilling uh, equipment to, to mine for gold, right? Cut long story. He, he got some gold and uh, to pay for, pay for the equipment and that. And... Um, then he was thrilling away again uh, and he couldn't get any gold. So he gave up and he sold all, all the machinery to a local scrap man. And the scrap man uh, got a specialist in the check and they, dug, they drilled down three foot and got all the gold, millions and millions worth of gold. Like, moral of the story is there, we give up too easy. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So that story stood with me a lot mm -hmm. through, because it made me realise, you know, when at the pub and the car business, all that stuff, I give up too easy, you know, so I never give up in this business. Like. Have you any advice for somebody that's watching and listening that's stuck in a dead end job that they're unhappy with, they haven't found their purpose, um, and maybe they're getting up on a Monday morning and they're thinking, fucking hell, is this as good as it gets for me? How do you find, how do we find our purpose? what can we do to help well how i found my purpose was i went on an event like you know and i broke my limiting beliefs you know um you know but mm. ask yourself you know ask yourself you know ask yourself what is it you'd love to do in life you know and mm. then st start taking steps to work to make that happen like do you know yeah. what i mean like so when i went to school uh I was laughed at if I put my hand up to answer a question, like, even by the school teacher. Do you know what I mean? But I always wanted to try and get uh, something right, but I never could. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So what I'm saying is I was the worst student in school, like. So if I can do that, I couldn't read or write when I left school, like. Mm. And still have started my second book now, like. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I can read now. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's my, I, I found my purpose, you know, but we all have a purpose. We all have different things, like. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, you said something important there. You said about um, kind of losing the self-limiting beliefs because, like, if you have experiences, like we've all had bad experiences of school, and you come out there thinking education is not for me, that is a self-limiting belief. But when you can push through that and try education, then you might realise fucking hell that belief I held for years was actually untrue. Yeah. And something mm -hmm. I taught myself for years yeah. was actually yeah. holding me back all this time. Yeah, mm. yeah. About go, breaking go. boundaries and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and getting to a limit. And what happens is when you do hit a certain stage and that then the education, when you go to a certain level and you start believing that when your your grades are consistently at seventy and seventy five and eighty percent a belief that oh God, you know what, I actually actually can do it and the confidence yeah. starts coming then with that and the self belief and you're changing that belief that's ingrained into you. You know, start getting new age. beliefs then yeah and then you start the challenge from my own experience you start thinking what other beliefs have i got that fucking mm -hmm. that i could never drive with the opposite to you i was off the road for when I, you know being in stolen cars when i was younger so i f I, I thought i'd never drive you know because you're like when you're off the road and then you're in in other odd cars and mm -hmm. you're off the, the band the con endorsements you think of fucking hell i never going to drive but then in year two in recovery 
the the band is starting to tick down and say, fuck it, we'll learn. Do you know, we'll do the theory test anyway. And then before you know it, you know, you're buying a car or, you know, university, marriage, you know, these things, like having your own gaff, you know. It's like fucking things that I thought that would never happen, but they do happen. Yeah. Um, but they'll only happen by challenging the perceptions we hold, you know, and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Do you know if somebody wanted to go to your event, is Facebook the best place to get you? You gave me a Facebook, yeah, 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 you gave me a Facebook. Um, do you know, for the practicalities of the event, are they three days long, you said? Three days long, yeah. Are they up in Manahan Cavern? Uh, our next one's in February in Westport. Come to Galway? Westport, yeah, me oh, no, oh, Westport. Oh, me oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah me <laughs> Very important <laughs> classification. Yeah. No, we won't up there. Oh, yeah. Were well, we supposed to go up there? Westport, where's some something about Westport is coming into my head there at the moment. There's, there's, there's a great story to where um, where I'm running dim, dim, dim events down Westport. I wrote about a guy called Austin in my book. Um, I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you'll meet him someday. Lovely mm-hmm. guy, like. But he's after building this retreat centre. Beautiful place. I've heard. Yeah, ah. I suppose that's the same guy, yeah. Yeah. My brother Tommy was telling me he was up there and he said it was ah. something out of this world. Yeah. It's, it's an yeah. amazing place, you know. So, we we were we we were the first ones in the door. Like I used to work for Austin years ago, like, <laughs> and uh, look, it's a, it's an amazing place, you know. So that's what it is. Know, if, if people are interested, um, what can they expect? Is it like uh, meditations, talks, get togethers? Look, it's uh, look at at this one here now. At the moment, we, we get the people, you know, if they can, to go down on the tours the evening. Do you know what I mean? Land down the tours mm-hmm. the evening, chill out and relax. Then, then, then the event starts on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, you know, so like if you if you have a look at some of the testimonies, you, you'll see what some people yeah. ha- has got over. Like you know, yeah. but you'll just well, you were talking about forgiveness there. You know, it, look that that's one part of it. You know, but it's like a program I have designed. Do you know what I mean? That'll go through each day. Do you know what I mean? You'll just find yourself just more at peace. You'll also find you you'll find your your your, your p- true potential like yeah. you that that's my goal mm-hmm. to bring to the people to like, get them to find that like, mm-hmm. in themselves like because they hear me talk and they see that I can do it like mm-hmm. but I show them exactly how I done it and how 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 they have to do it and how, it also comes with um which is very powerful uh coaching sessions after like you know it's really the coaching sessions is really like uh, mm-hmm. very important after you know because it keeps you it keeps you up there excellent and we'll put all the links yeah. into the description of the video and, and the podcast the uh, yeah. and, 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 and your link book. to the book yeah. Yeah. Um, congratulations on the book best yeah. of luck Thanks. with the second and book and your second book Thanks to me. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah. The, ju- the, the, the journey continues. Mm. Absolutely. I know you're on this one hour podcast, so it's all downhill from here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you, you want you want to talk about? Well, after asking you a lot of questions there now, but is there anything you and that's in the back of your mind that you'd like to talk about? No, look, man, uh, you know, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, it was actually... Uh, I think it was Stevie McGowan was telling me about you guys. Yeah. <clears throat> so I come home that day and... Uh, I put this on YouTube and I, and I see what you're doing. I swear mm. to God, I just got a tear down my eye yeah. because it, this here is just so, so, Healing, so yeah. needed. Like, mm. do you know what I mean? So, what you're doing, guys, is amazing. You know what I mean? Thank That's, you very much, Julie. You know, Brilliant. That. No, thanks a million. And no yeah. people are going to watch this and they're going to be able to relate with you. And you know, it will spread the message and yeah. we'll keep up. We have by giving it away, as an old saying in recovery. And that's kind of what we're all doing here. So, congratulations on everything you've done so far and best of luck with everything you will do. And safe journey home. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Thanks very much for Thank coming you. on. It's a pleasure meeting you again and chatting to you. Likewise. You know, and I mean that. Thank you. Yeah. We, see, we see everybody next week. See you there, Tom. Shania. <laughs>